want to acknowledge my co-authors, Chantal Iyengar and Barsun. Um, so this work seeks to connect uh, two patterns we've seen in the U.S. Uh, rise in what we've called effective polarization and a proliferation of media. Um, so we've been working, Chantal and Bora and I have been working on this project showing that uh, partisans dislike each other more today than they have in the past. And we've documented it in a number of ways. There's a rise in the gap in feeling thermometers between Democrats and Republicans and how they feel towards each other. Uh, there's an increase in social distance. Um, partisans say today that they'd be more unhappy if their son or daughter were marry someone from the other party than in the past. Uh, and there's Democrats are much less likely today to say that uh, other side is uh, intelligent, for instance. Uh, Shanto and Sean Westwood, another recent paper showing there's a rise in implicit bias. Um, there's, they do a bunch of trust games. There's a lack of trust between partisans. Uh, so the obvious next question is what is the causes this rise in effective polarization? There's lots of uh, ideas, almost, I think, sensible. Rising elite polarization. Uh, the rise in gap uh, today. Uh, elites today are more polarized than they've ever since the Civil War, uh, currently. Uh, there's a decline in cross-cutting identities. Uh, this is Liliana Mason's work showing that uh, Democrats are much, well, Republicans are more likely to be conservative than in the past, so this increases hostilities. Uh, we show in the paper there's a rise in negativity in campaigns. Um, so we link that. And what I want to talk about today is media proliferation and selective exposure. Uh, there's, why would selective exposure lead to a rise in partisan animus? Um, one, or media proliferation lead to a rise in uh, partisan animus. Uh, there's been an explosive growth of information, uh, and this leads to information overload. Uh, so people tend to use partisan cues to filter that information down. Uh, and when you, uh, there's also a rise in inadvertent exposure to partisan news. Uh, so, you know, people are on Facebook, uh, shot Solomon Messing is in the paper on this showing that, you know, you're on Facebook, you, people tend to live in a homogenous network, their friends share partisan news. Uh, so all this, uh, combined with these theories of motivated reasoning, uh, leads us to select media that is more uh, consistent with our private partisan uh, priors and subsequently polarization. Uh, so what we're interested in in particular is broadband internet. How has this led to uh, inter-party hostility? Uh, we're interested in media proliferation generally, but the broadband is a good uh, measure for it because media exposure is strongly elastic. Uh, so people who have broadband versus dialogue, for instance, spend about 1,300 more minutes a month on the so we argue that you know, just the extra time you spend online means more exposure to partisan media. So there's a uh, problem with this. Uh, there's a problem with all this work. Um, generally, uh, hold on. There's a puzzle with all this work. Generally, uh, it's a much better way of saying it. Um, in that. Uh, the way we would usually do this at the individual level is say, does a person have broadband access or not? Uh, and then we correlate it with inter-party animus or whatever DB we're looking at. But we have an issue in that inter-party -party animus and broadband exposure is could be endogenous. The same factors that cause exposure to broadband also cause inter-party hostility. More educated people, uh, people with higher income are both more likely to have access and more hostile. Uh, so what we need is an instrument that causes uh, internet access, but doesn't cause effective exposure, as we call it, through any other means. Uh, so to put it another way, uh, variables are likely to cause education income, are likely to cause broadband access and effective polarization. We need some instrument that causes this, because it's not related to effective exposure in any other way. Uh, fortunately, uh, had such an instrument, uh, right-of-way laws. 
the Telecommunication Act of 1996 said municipalities have the right to regulate right of way. Right of way are the uh, easements that, uh, on public land that telecommunication companies, for instance, use to build infrastructure. Uh, so it's the federal government said states have the right to regulate this to decide how fees are uh, paid, how taxes are levied, etc. Uh, but shortly thereafter, states passed laws regulating municipal controls, control over right of way. So now there's variation in uh, right of way. So some states are more restrictive, uh, making it less or less easy, more costly to build infrastructure. Other states are more uh, are easier in other states. So our instrument is an index that tallies how liberal in a free market sense, uh, how restrictive uh, row right away laws are. We have three levels of data, uh, state level, which are the right away laws, county level, which are the number of providers in a county, and individual level, which is inter-party animosity. Uh, so at the, our instrument is 52 indicators of of state right away, how restrictive or unrestricted it is. Uh, this deals with deployment regulations, supply side promotions, and demand side promotions. So, uh, limit of fees uh, and tax incentives for uh, companies, um, discounts for consumers. Uh, and this is the uh, distribution, just uh, ocular tests. You see that red states. So, the notion with instrumental variables is that it's exogenous. We go into this into a lot of detail in the paper, but you don't, I don't see any, any pattern. You know, red states and blue states, north states, south states, they all seem to be fairly distributed. Um, our endogenous independent variable broadband access, we do not have individual level uh, data on if a person has, with at least our data set, if a person has broadband access or not. So we use an indirect measure, which lots of people have shown is a good, uh, so your work, uh, is a good indicator of uh, person has it, it's the number of broadband providers in the zip code, which is uh, from the ICC. So uh, here's the relationship between the number of providers in a, in a zip code logged and the subscription per 1,000 residents. You see a very strong relationship. Uh, our outcome measure is two large surveys from the National Amber Survey, which we pool. Uh, we grade the candidates on a variety of indicators. Uh, we take feelings towards the in-party candidate, feelings towards the out-party candidate. Uh, we rescale to light between zero and one. Um, I think I'll see this. Um, so the validity and the power of the instrument, there's notion to be a strong instrument has to be, well, to be a good instrument, it has to be strong, and it has to meet the exclusion restriction, and it's not associated with other things. Um, so you see here that you know it does predict, so this is the first stage, that it predicts the number of providers in the zip code, uh, that's the row index. So uh, the less restrictive a, the row laws are in a state, uh, the more so, uh, broadband providers there are in that, that zip code. Uh, so strength of, of the instrument, usually they use a 10 a rule of thumb that makes the F test greater than 10 between the null model and the model with the, the first stage model, and you see it's much greater than 10. We did a number of tests of the exclusion assumption. You can't verify this, but you can show evidence in favor of it. Roe is not related to the ideology of the mass public. Uh, legislature the governor, governor's party is not related to median state uh, income or the state education levels. Uh, past county level affect does not predict future uh, broadband penetration. So we feel okay with that. Uh, so now the uh, big finding, effect of row and broadband access on effective polarization. Uh, first, the reduced form estimate. Uh, so does the instrument predict animosity? You see that it does. Everything's logged, so it's not that, uh, at least to me, not that clear what it means. Um, what this indicates is that uh, increasing, going from the most restricted to least restrictive row laws leads to about a 3% uh, increase in effective polarization. Um, now, number of providers. Um, again, this is. If you increase the number of providers by 10%, this leads to a one-point increase in effective polarization. Still not totally clear what that means. Um, so between 2000 and 2004, on average, uh, broadband penetration increased by 30%. In counties, between 2004 and 2008, broadband penetration increased about 60% per 
counties. So the effect of, of internet in those years, the broadband access was 3% and 6%. To put this, to benchmark this, the effect of political interest, or the relationship between political interest and effective polarization is about 13 points. So it's half the size, um, which is, it's not a huge effect, but you know, it's not trivial. And given all the, especially by Marcus Pryor saying, internet, media proliferation, it really doesn't matter. Uh, we're happy to see that effect. And especially, yep. Yeah. So we tried different model specifications on the controls and add controls. Same things. We use a very different and, and more fine grained instrument. Um, so the Economic Research Service uh, has a typology at the county level of type of land. It's more expensive to build the internet on uneven land and easier on flat land. We see, so if you use this in this instrument, we pretty much get the same results. Uh, how much time do I have? Yeah. One minute. Okay, so. We, we make an argument that it's caused by partisan media access. And we show that uh, with passive data and, uh, and uh, um, self-reported data that those with broadband uh, spend more time on the internet than dial-up. Uh, there's going to be a paper, which later today, which I, uh, I also believe that in a polarized environment, any exposure to news is going to lead to more. About it, but that's not what we show on paper. So this is my story. Uh, uh, so inter-party hostility has grown in the U.S. So most of the regional parties of the media. We showed that broadband there's a causal effect, um, and we show that in a more associative sense that broadband access yields more exposure to partisan news. Um, and there's lots of experiments looking at partisan news to hostility. So we feel like we have the whole story if we combine all the data. We're not the first to find increased reach partisan media as an effect on polarization, but I think we're the first to show an effect on, on the internet. We don't believe that this is the only reason animosity has increased. There's lots of reasons, but we feel like if we start compiling them, we get a, a better picture of where we are today. Um, yeah, and finally, one thing that I kind of mentioned is that there's lots of reasons that prior says that are countervailing, that there's a rise of cross-cutting information that could lead to less polarization. Um, there's a rise of entertainment media, which will lead to polarization. So despite this, we still see a positive effect. Thanks.